brothers and sisters in the Dharma. Good morning. May you all be well, happy, and peaceful. We are going to have a presentation entitled of humor, laughter, and wisdom. The texts are in English and Chinese, but the narration is in English. Now, this particular topic is quite interesting in the sense that there are jokes for you to enjoy and also to laugh at. You know, laughter is good for health. But the very important thing is that we are able to learn life lessons and dharma so that our wisdom can grow in our life. Uh, to be able to embrace so many happenings in life with a mind that is good, clear, wise, alert, attentive, and so on. So we're going to look at 10 situations of humor, or you can say jokes. And then after that, we will have reflection for each of the jokes, actually. So, you will now watch a PowerPoint. And before that, well, let me check the uh, setup to make sure it's in order. Okay. Now let us launch the PowerPoint. Uh, now you see the first cover slide of humor, laughter, and wisdom. I put in some animated images to make the presentation more interesting. I do use quite a number of cartoon images. Uh, uh, we don't put the faces of people, you know, uh, because they may not like it if they happen to see. So now you can see that these four animated cartoon images to note the idea of humor and laughter. Lah. Whereas the center one connotes the point of thinking, reflecting on what the jokes are all about, and then to grow in wisdom. Uh, that is the meaning of the cover slide. Now let us go on to the first one. Oh, not yet. This is also introduction to the jokes. Now, I put this a very interesting uh, statement. A laugh a day keeps the doctor away. You are familiar with the, I think, proverb, a doctor a day keeps, uh, so uh, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. But now we put a laugh a day keeps the doctor away. And actually, research has shown that humor and laughter are very, very good. They have lots of benefits to our body as well as the mind. They benefit our physiology as well as our mental states. Now, in one book called Anatomy of an Illness, this Dr. Norman Kersen, sir, had cancer. And the doctors told him that uh, you will have not many months to live. But he decided to use laughter therapy uh, to cure his cancer. So, you know, he bought many humor books and then also bought those days, uh, the videotapes, uh, humor videotapes, laughter videotapes. And then after some months, uh, his cancer disappeared. So actually, I'm not going to uh, talk on the many benefits of laughter and humor. Uh. Now, there's another quotation uh, which is quite interesting uh, using English words. He who laughs, laughs. Right? Uh, in other words, people who are able to laugh and see the lighter vein of life will be perhaps more healthy and can live longer. Lah, right? Then this put for thought, the wise ones, knowing the true nature of things, live in harmony and peace with themselves, with others, and the outside world. It's very important that we have harmony and mental peace within ourselves and with other people whom we associate with and also with the environment 
Ah, that is something very important, isn't it? So for this, uh, we need the wisdom to understand the true nature of things. So I'm trying to use uh, some humor and jokes to convey certain important life lessons that tells us that we should not take our life but so seriously to the extent that our mental health is affected. We grow in wisdom. Uh, so this is the message and you can see the laughter of the cartoon uh, images. Now let us go on to the first joke. And it is titled, Let's Get Married. Uh, for those who know how to read Chinese, I hope uh, the Google, I don't know how to write Chinese. I don't read Chinese. So I use the Google Translate. Oh, there might be some errors, but you can get the gist of it. Lah. Because it's not easy to get a volunteer huh, to do all the translation and then uh, to put into the slides. It's not easy. So it will be very troublesome for people. So I was thinking, well, can I get anybody, any volunteer? Then try a Google translation. Now, an ugly looking but brilliant doctor once told a dull-witted nurse, a dumb nurse, like you can say, huh? And then what did he tell the nurse? Even though you have little brains, uh, but your looks are simply grey. And what did the dumb nurse say happily? Oh, thank you, doctor. You know, how great you would be if we were to get married. We'll have children with your intelligence and my looks. In other words, he's saying that, wow, you know, our children will be as brilliant as you, uh, the fantastic, brilliant doctor. And then the beauty, as you say, I have that beauty. And what did the doctor remark? What if our children have my looks and your brains? <laughs> oh, that's a punchline. Huh? Oh, what if our children turn out to be very, very stupid, low IQ, right? That is... He said to say like your brains. Lah. And then, uh, like my looks, so ugly looking. Ah, that is a joke. Lah. But uh, we can do some wise reflection. We cannot assume that things will turn out the way we want them. Fantasy and reality can be worlds apart. So you have to be very careful. Nothing is certain in the future. You may have all the data and so on. You predict this. You expect this. But things may turn out in another way. And sometimes to your sorrow, to your suffering, because you have great expectations. Whereas if we are wise, we understand that nothing is certain in life. We cannot really predict the future. And that is the way things are. Then we can learn to embrace the things, the happenings of life more peacefully, come what may. So that is wisdom. So isn't a, this is a very good uh, life lesson, a good Dharma teaching? To be able to accept the eight worldly wings, uh, sometimes pleasure, sometimes pain, suffering, and so on. So this is a joke, but from here we can reflect on important life lessons. Now let us go on to the next humor piece. The title is The VIP. Ah, very important person. So a man once barged his way into a conference hall. As he had no name tag, the usher threw him out of the side exit. Ah, probably a very important conference where you need certain registrations and then also name tags might be sent to you or when you register, you get the name tags and so on. Then only you are allowed into the hall. Many conferences are like that. Well, some of them are very expensive conferences where you have to pay a huge sum. So not any Tom, Dick and Harry can just get in. So this man uh, just, you know, somehow or other, you know, because he was thinking he was a VIP. La. So he made his way in. And then what did the usher, <clears throat> you can say the person uh, who's helping uh, to uh, check in the person, uh, to lead the person into the seat and so on. So they caught hold of him and then they threw him out of the side exit. Of course, the big conference hall has a main door, the main entrance, as well as many side 
door, small doors. Uh. This VIP, so-called VIP, was very angry. Hey, do you know that I belong to a very important family in town? Do you know that? I'm a VIP, you know. So the uh, ushers uh, told the man, very sorry, sir. Very sorry, sir. So they got a hold of him again. And this time they went to the main door. Main door and then threw him out instead of side door. VIP, ma. So out through the main door. Now this is just a joke. But you can see uh, that a lot of suffering comes uh, when we are so concerned with the self, the ego. Actually, it's the ego self in us that gives rise also to a lot of suffering, right? It's craving, attachment, uh, the delusion of an I and an ego that gives rise to suffering. So this person was full of pride, conceit. The ego is so big, so he thinks he can do whatever he wants, but you are going to face with difficulties. So beware. The ego, pride, and conceit can lead a person to much dukkha or suffering. And if you just reflect in your life, very often you have suffering through your interaction with people, then you realize it's because of this delusion of the self. He's talking bad about me. He's blaming me. He doesn't give me recognition. It's all me, I, my. So that is a very important life lesson we can learn from this simple humor piece. Now let us go to the next one. Ah, this is the next humor piece title Cheap Hearing Aid. Ah. Now we know there are people uh, who are hard of hearing. Especially when you grow older, we cannot hear so easily, isn't it? People need to speak louder. But nowadays, technology is so advanced, we can put in a pair of hearing aids into our ears, and then, you know, you will magnify uh, the talk, uh, the sound, uh, the voice, uh, and you can hear better. Uh, that's, a cheap, uh, that's a hearing aid. It can be very expensive ones also. But I, some of my friends uh, who are hard of hearing, so they, they told me that uh, it's quite difficult because it's very, you know, not very comfortable. Of course, it, it cannot replace the natural hearing, but then at least it helps. Uh. So there was this miser, a very stingy person, and he needed a hearing aid. Uh, probably uh, he was getting old, or maybe some problems of the hearing and the ear. But he was a miser, very, very stingy. So he was unwilling to spend much money, perhaps even though he was very wealthy. So he went to the place where you could get these hearing aids. How much does a pair of hearing aids cost? He asked the salesperson. Oh, it can range between $2 and $2,000. Different qualities, isn't it? All right? The salesperson replied, and this person, being a miser, said, I'll try the $2 model, the miser said. So the salesperson helped the miser put on the hearing device that costs only $2. Uh. The miser complained, you know, it doesn't work. Then the salesperson said, what do you expect of a $2 thing? Anyway, people will talk louder when they see you wearing it. Uh, they know you, you cannot hear it. Lah. So people will talk louder. Lo. And this stupid miser. So okay, lah, I'll buy it. Lah. <laughs> so he doesn't really serve the purpose, isn't it? All right. So, so basically, it is the issue of being, ma, uh, being a miser, being stingy like Mr. Scrooge. So very, very kiam siap. Huh? Uh, so if uh, you are very miserly in your life, very stingy, or oh, ask him to do dana, uh, uh, he will not. Uh, uh. So a uh, miser will actually live a life of suffering. Who would want to relate well to with a miser? Nobody really likes a miser. 
There are people like that, you know. Uh, uh, you know, they would not uh, give you any treat, but they expect uh, every time you pay, when uh, uh, he goes up with a group of friends, uh, he would not pay. He's miserly. Uh, actually, in the world, you have like this. So if a person is very miserly and uh, doesn't practice generosity, charity, uh, this uh, will affect him. If not later in this life, future reverts. As in Majima Nikaya, say a person who is very stingy, very kedekut uh, lah, will face with a uh, vipaka, a consequence lah. They can be reborn uh, into a very poor family. Uh, no money. Whereas others are full of generosity, uh, uh, like Bill Gates and so on. Uh. So, they can have good rebirths in the sense that they can have wealth in future lives. Uh. That's what is in the Majima Nikaya. Okay, so I hope you understand this. Very simple one. So that is this cheap hearing aids. Now let us go to the next one. It's called the cheating husband. Ah, you know what it means. Lah. A husband who cheats on the wife is the person who is not faithful, lah, not loyal. He commits probably adultery or what we say, infidelity. And this after she reflect on the Dharma message. A wife slapped her husband at the face after discovering a piece of paper in his wallet with the name Betty written on it. It was the name of a house I bet on yesterday. The husband protested strongly. So after having been slapped by the wife, then the husband asked why. And the wife said, ah, I saw uh, the name of a woman written uh, on a piece of paper found in your wallet. Uh, you must be fooling around with other ladies even though you're married. And so on, and then give him a slap. Lah. Then the husband said, No, I'm innocent. Uh, the name Betty uh, was the name of a horse. You know, I would sometimes go to the racing grounds and then I would bet on horses and have some winnings. Lah. So, what to do? Well, so, uh, then the following day when he came back, right, from work or so on, the wife slap him again. He said, what the heck? What are you slapping me for? You slapped me yesterday, now you slap me again. Ah. What was that for? He asked. Your horse called last night. The wife replied. Uh, your horse telephoned last night, which means that this proved that Betty, the name of a woman, right? identified. So the husband was lying. He was cheating on the wife. Uh, so when he reflect on the Dharma message, lying and committing adultery are unwholesome acts. A breaking of moral precepts. You know very well that one of the five precepts, the fourth one, uh, is not to lie. Uh, not to be dishonest and lie. And the third one is to not to commit adultery because these unwholesome actions, uh, right, or akusala kamala, we call it Pali, uh, will bring to the person who is committing the wrongs, will bring to the person a lot of suffering and dukkha. In this life itself, or in future lives. And not only that, you know, when you break these precepts, you can cause uh, much suffering to other people. Let's say you cheat with your lies during business. Uh, then you lie to somebody. Uh, say, you know, uh, I saw your, your husband uh, like this, like this. Or I saw your wife like this, like this. Actually, it's not true. All lies. Uh, and you cause the quarrel and the breakup in the family. So cause other people to suffer, isn't it, through the lying? Uh, you know, the famous... Uh, children's story of the boy who cried wolf. Right? And then, of course, uh, you will actually cause dukkha to yourself. You will face with problems and uh, difficulties later on. It's called the ripening of the bad karma. Not in this life, also future life. And likewise, also this adultery. I think, you know, in all religions, uh, in Islam, you have zina, 
uh, in Christianity, all religions also talk about the evil of adultery because this adultery causes the breakup of a harmonious family and the children will especially will suffer. All parties will suffer, including the person who has committed the adultery. So we have to reflect on these Dharma messages very, very carefully because they can bring much to come. Some people, you know, think that, well, you see, I know of the friends who committed adultery, who lie in the business, and fight that, you know, until old age or so, nothing happened. Ah, he got some good blessings from the past Kamala. But how do you know how he's going to die? How do you know what will happen to him after that? And all religions uh, uh, talk about this. There is no such thing as after uh, when a person dies, nothing else, everything, nothing. No, there is still survival after that. Huh? Uh, Christians and Muslims believe in the hell and heaven. And then the Buddhists and Hindus believe in rebirth. So the rebirth can take place in a horrible suffering state. So that's not the end of things. So there's no escape from the law of karma. So this is a very good message based on just a simple humor piece. Let's look at the next one. Ah, oh, this one talks about what? I know what you are up to now. I know what you are up to now. There was this husband, right? Probably he was flinging around with other ladies. I'm so or maybe he was having even a pass. In other words, again, infidelity, not faithful and uh, 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 to the wife. So you say, the wife came to know it and uh, sometimes would complain and say, you know, I heard that uh, you've been fooling around with some ladies and so on. Uh, because the wife uh, used to check his jacket uh, and will find the strands of ladies' hair. No? Not the wife's hair, the wife could recognize her own hair. Lah. So then one day uh, he told the wife, darling, I've turned over a new leaf. I've changed my ways already. See, no more strands of ladies' hair on my shirt. Or oh, his jacket also. Uh, huh? I don't fool around with women anymore. I'm faithful to you, darling. I've stored my bad ways and bad habits already. Then the wife's still not very happy. Some of my friends say uh, that they have seen you visiting temples now. No ladies' hair on your shirt? Ah, now I know. You are now fooling around with the nuns. <laughs> uh, so uh, this wife, uh, uh, suspicious character also. Uh, so he was, uh, she was jealous also, right? And uh, didn't trust the husband. Maybe the husband had some wrong uh, early part of the life. Uh. So... Of course, the husband could visit temples because uh, he, from his conduct, he could change his ways and probably got interested in uh, Dhamma or whatever. You know, I mean, the possibility, isn't it? But then this, uh, this uh, wife is sometimes a bit uh, unreasonable already. Uh, uh, jealousy is still there because no more trust. They say, oh, no more hair on your shirt. Ah. Why? Because you're fooling with nuns. Ma. Uh, you know very well, uh, nuns are clean shaven, ah, right? No hair. One, ah. uh, that's a very interesting point. So when trust and understanding are lacking in the marriage and there is strong jealousy of one spouse towards the other, relationship is affected. Definitely the marriage may be going to the rocks if trust has broken down, no more understanding, often bickering and quarreling because no more trust will be. And also doesn't have the forgiving attitude perhaps. So a marriage that's successful has to be built on Understanding, uh, love, la, love, understanding, trust, right? patience, tolerance, many other good qualities. Uh, so this, this, of course, is a, a joke, but also involves uh, this issue of not being loyal or faithful to the wife. La, right? But anyway, the husband did confess. You know? But anyway, that's a joke. But the important thing is the message for the wise reflection that I've written. Uh, so remember these important qualities, not only between husbands and wives, also friends, uh, 
or you know members in the family there must be trust understanding the other party and also you know really have better compassion and of course very important wisdom right? then you know how to relate and interact so that is this joke title i know what you are up to now oh, pulling around with nuns all right let's go to the next one uh, this is called a marriage anniversary. You know, uh, married couples uh, celebrate the uh, first anniversary of the marriage and then 25th year, uh, 50th year golden anniversary, 60th year, 60th year diamond anniversary, 25th year, I think it must be the silver anniversary and so on. So some, of course, will celebrate every year. Lah. So there was this married couple, both the husband and wife were 60 years old. So they were celebrating their 35th wedding anniversary. Uh, there are different versions of this story, actually. Uh, you have heard it before, but I've heard it so many times, different versions, but I always will reflect uh, and I find that, wow, you know, the Damar is actually very good. So, so they were celebrating 35th Wedding anniversary, uh, not yet the 50th wedding anniversary. Uh, the 50th will be the golden one. So during their party, right? So during their party, at one stage they went to the garden, la, you can say, or whatever, la, right? Uh, so there was a wizard that appeared, you know, to them only, right? Maybe, la, right? So the wizard congratulated them, appeared to congratulate them and then grant them each one wish. So the wizard told them, oh, each of you, after having been married for 35 years, you are given one wish only and that wish will come true. So the wife said, the wife wanted to travel around the world. And poof, wow, just uh, uh, with a magic wand, uh, 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 Chika chika boom bay ba, maybe chanted some magic words. Huh? Then the white palm, eh, suddenly appearing in the in her hand, uh, were tickets, uh, and these tickets uh, enable her to go for a world cruise, you know. Uh, fantastic. Uh. Then uh, no more already. Lah. Then after that, uh, the wizard asked the husband what he wanted. He said, yes, now it's your turn. What do you want? And he said, I wish. Uh, he said very softly to the wizard. Uh, so that the wife could not hear. Lah. He said, I wish I had a wife 30 years younger than me. Uh, this is a so low husband. Lah. So, you know, 30 years old. So he's hoping that if his wife were 30 years old, lah, wow, very sexy, beautiful and so on. Not like now, uh, uh, with drooping shoulders and drooping breasts lah, and that's so fat. Lah. All those things, lah, you know, so this is a so husband. Lah. So the wizard said, okay. So he picked up his magic wand, uh, like you see Harry Potter. Uh, and then he uttered some words, chika chika boom beba. And suddenly, the husband, 60 years old, one turned into a very, very old man. 90 years old. Uh, you uh, got the tongkat appearing up for him also. Uh, so old, really bald-headed and so on. Uh, correct? Uh, his wish was granted, isn't it? 90 years old. Now the wife. 60 years old, different still. 30 years old, the so wife was 30 years younger. Uh, so uh, you see the Dharma reflection is very good. Unwholesome thoughts or wishes sometimes come true in the most unexpected manner to the disappointment or the suffering, the danger or the detriment to the wisher. Uh, so you see, uh, sometimes uh, you want certain things, you know, uh, you wish for certain things. And these things happen, but not what you think you want. You maybe think that with the data, with the circumstances, that's what I would get. Uh, that my son would marry a very good uh, wife, very educated, just like him, uh, top university and so on. All those wishes, uh, not necessarily will come true. Very often they don't. 
And you will be frustrated, you'll be sad, and you'll be miserable. Why? Because the things that you don't want happen to you. Whereas if you have done the five contemplations in Dhamma, the one of it is, this is Dukkha. When things you don't want happen to you, when things you want don't happen to you, you have expectations, you have high expectations, and these expectations don't come the way that you want, then suffering, misery, and dukkha happens. So when you reflect on this, you say, yeah, life is uncertain. We don't know what is going to happen. Oh, you say, oh, you know, I have been hospitalized for a few days already. The specialists will tell me that I will get well, I'll be discharged, but it doesn't happen that way. There's, there's this very interesting uh, account given by Acham Brahm when he was uh, younger, uh, all right? So he got you no know, sickness uh, in the forest of Thailand. Then he was hospitalized, maybe it was for typhus or malaria or one of those tropical uh, sicknesses. So he was feeling terrible, uh, you know, he was still young. Uh, now he was uh, hoping inside his mind, how oh, I wish my great master, Achan Cha, would come to console me and say some good words. Uh, that would probably uh, he is a uh, so he may make me better. I should be getting better. Really. So one day, really, the master paid a visit to him at the hospital. So then he told the master, right? Oh, master, I've been in the hospital how many days already? Huh? I should be like this, I should be like that, right? But he's not, I'm not getting better. So he was still hoping for the expectation, the wish that the master would say some words. Then right, the master just kept quiet for some time. Then after that, uh, the master told him, Brahma Vamso, you are going to get better or you're going to die. And then he walked away, right? Oh, he got the shock of his life, but the master knew that he could accept the Dhamma there. So he reflected the mind very true. Huh? I'm complaining this, complaining that, should be like this, should be like that. But it is not like that. So what you say very true. Huh? I think I'm going to die. Oh, I'm going to recover and so on. And that change of attitude, the wisdom arising, the mind brightens. Huh? So he was cured. He became better. Oh, that was fantastic account that I heard huh? <laughs> in one of the talks. Huh? So remember this. Huh? Uh, especially when you wish for unwholesome thoughts or wishes, uh, all sorts of thoughts and wishes, uh, expectations. Uh, uh. So, of course, you've read the Charles Dickens book, Great Expectations. I've heard that very interesting Dharma talk by Acham Brahm, No Expectations. Uh, <laughs> very interesting. You should, read, uh, you should listen to that talk on the YouTube. No Expectations. Then you find that you can be more peaceful. So this actually is a very important uh, message. Uh, don't think that uh, whatever you wish for uh, will happen the way you want. And in this case, yeah, wow, it happens in a terrible way. Uh, this cause and effect. <laughs> All right, let's go on to the next one. It's called indecent dressing. Now, what is this thing about indecent? Not proper. Uh, <laughs> indecent. A couple was having a heated argument over their teenage daughter's dressing when she was about to go out on a date one night. You know, so this husband and wife were arguing about the daughter's dressing, actually. So what did the wife complain about? You should be more strict with your daughter's dressing. The wife screamed at her husband. She's almost naked. Bras, hot pants. You know, she could be molested or raped. You know, uh, you could see the picture there. Huh? Huh? Not drawn by me. Huh? Uh, drawn by one of my, uh, I mean, probably former students or what. Anyway, so you see this, what she was referring to. Huh? Just, uh, bra, hot pants, very scantily dressed. Huh? Right? Then, you know, the husband was a bit annoyed that the wife was scream, uh, and instead of telling nicely, scream. So, she used abusive, harsh speech. So, she got back the consequence uh, <laughs> immediately, uh, the bad effect. Uh. <laughs> uh, so, you see, uh, actually, uh, it's not proper to use harsh speech. Uh. You get it. Uh, not even, uh, I mean, so fast, you get it. So, the wife shout, uh, the husband shouted back at the wife. 
you have a short term memory. 18 years ago, when I dated you out one night, well, I mean, the, the two of them have got married very, very young. <laughs> you were even more scantily dressed. Ah. That time, ah, ah, yo, your dress even worse than the dress of our daughter now. <laughs> so, of course, it's just a joke. But actually, we can reflect. Ah. In the Dhammapada, actually, you have this first. It's easy to see other spots. But one's own one hides like a fowler in disguise. So the wise reflection is easy to see other faults, but some oftentimes we one cannot remember or see one's own faults, you know? and then you start uh, blaming, you start cursing, you start complaining, you start condemning, you start criticizing all those wrong speech uh, of other towards other people because you see their faults, but you don't realize that you also have maybe even more faults. So this is a very good lesson for us. Uh, but even let's say we need to point out certain things, there are very good gentle ways, uh, kind speech, la, you know, and so on. La. But this was uh, using abusive speech. And then hit back one shot already. Is it? And this is what happens oftentimes. You know? People always point their fingers at other people's faults and they forget their own. Uh, you see? So it's very important to reflect. And then the other point is today we see many parents not acting as good role models for their children. So you must understand also, why did the daughter behave like this? Was she given a good moral education? Was she brought up well? Ah, so all these things actually, we have to consider. And I would say today, uh, so many problems among the young people uh, can be traced to the family. Uh, problems in the family, husband and wife always, always quarreling, uh, and then occupied with their own hobbies. Uh, now even worse, uh, uh, so busy with their... Uh, Facebook or with the WhatsApp chat and so on. So how much time do they have for the children's education? Uh, for academic education, send for tuition. Moral education, virtually zero. In school, uh, the teachers do not emphasize on this. And then, you know, people ask them, why don't you send to PBHP uh, Dharma classes? I uh, no use one. Uh, uh. My child uh, went for a few days and said, that, no use one, mommy. May you stress more, don't see that. So the parents uh, just listen to the children and then to take the easy way out so that they can do their own things, just give the small kid, uh, sometimes just a few years old only, kindergarten or whatever, give the player an iPad, la, a smartphone. Wow, they will be so taken with all those, you think, uh, lessons are no. All those uh, killing, uh, the games, la, all those sums. Yeah. So what do you expect when they grow up? So this is one of the factors contributing to so many teenage problems in society today. So this is a very good life lesson just based on a simple joke. Now let us go on to the next one. I'll do anything. That's the title of this joke. A sexy young lady undergraduate still studying at the university entered a young professor's office. Right? The professors have their own rooms, uh, so for people to go and consult about the lectures and so on. Uh. So this sexy young lady, undergraduate, maybe second year or third year or whatever, uh, entered the young professor's office. She closed the door and knelt down pleadingly. I would do anything to pass this exam, she pleaded. Then she then leaned closer to the professor flipped back her hair and gazed sexily into his eyes. I mean, she whispered, I will do anything. And I think you would know, uh, she had some terrible thoughts and intentions, la, uh, willing even to sell the body. La. Then the professor returned her gaze and said, anything? Yes, absolutely anything, she said sexily. She thought she would succeed in her game already. La. The professor whispered to her, go back and study your lecture notes. Uh, you say you will do anything. You go back. <laughs> Hit back on her uh, for her bad thoughts and bad intentions. You might think it's a joke, but actually uh, when I was at the university, there were similar cases. No? Some of the you know, uh, pretty girls uh, wearing the time hot pants uh, uh, they will visit the professor and so on, try to get tips. Uh, 
Uh, they say, oh, professor, how do we know? After the exam all over, they only reveal it. Uh, that's how we knew. So they would tell the professor. He said, professor, so much to study. You see, big set of lecture notes. Uh, don't know where to start. No. Then the professor uh, would take the set of notes from their hands and then flip, flip, flip and come down. This part, have you studied? And then the, the girl would just uh, very, very sadly uh, she shook her head, say, no, I haven't. You better study this one. <laughs> so, tips. Uh, oh, those are tips. And these, uh, these girls are uh, actually for their own benefit, uh, isn't it? And then how do we know? Uh, after uh, the whole thing was over already, uh, you know, then it, it reveals uh, a lot of these things, a lot of stories uh, of the universities also. So, this is a Dhamma message. This is the life lesson. There is a price to pay if one resorts to immoral ways in order to succeed. Yes. You want to succeed in anything, whether, whether worldly things like your business or your job or even your studies. And then you want to succeed in growing your mind. You must remember that one of the very important things is morality. We must have morality, keep the precepts, don't do immoral things in order to gain something, in order to succeed. Nah. And for Dhamma people also, that's because of ignorance. Nah. Uh, they do things which are of delusion. Nah. It happens in all religions. Nah. Doing some things, uh, doing certain things which can be quite harmful, no? offer animal sacrifice nah, in order to gain certain things, nah, strike a uh, Magnum or whatever. Lah. So there is a price to pay. Later part in the life and in future lives, you will suffer for those immoral actions. The immoral actions uh, can lead to suffering. There is no substitute for diligent and honest hard work. And that applies also to Dharma practice. Uh. But ordinary life, you know, you want to be successful in your studies, in your job, in your career, to be successful, to have a happy family. You have to have the good honors, effort and work put into it. Then you can meet with the success. This is a very, very important, wise lesson. Now let us go on to the next one. Paying with kisses. Ah, what is this paying with kisses? At the department store, a pretty girl asks, how much does that fabric material for a dress cost? She wanted to buy a cloth. Uh, you see, uh, the fabric cloth, she wanted maybe to uh, make a dress or whatever. Then this smirking male promoter replied, uh, this was a hamsap, last full salesperson. I uh, uh, say, only one kiss per meter. You want to buy one meter? Uh, I, I can blunt you. Uh, you just give me one kiss. Uh. Then this girl said, good, I'll take 10 meters. Uh, that means uh, she wanted to buy 10 meters of the cloth, uh, the pretty girl said. Wow, this young man, uh, because this girl was probably quite beautiful and sexy. Uh, wow, very feeling excited all over. No? So he was willing even uh, uh, to cut the 10 meters and offer to her and getting the 10 kisses. What's uh, up, so feeling excited all over, the male promoter measured out uh, and then wrapped the cloth. Uh. Uh, then he teasingly uh, approached the girl, uh, held it out to the girl customer, waiting to receive payment in terms of kisses. Uh. Then the girl snapped up the package, uh, took the package of the cloth and then pointed to the old man who was standing quite near her. Uh, right? Pointed to the old man standing beside her and then said with a smile, Grandpa will pay the bill. <laughs> that means uh, the payment actually is done by the grandpa. So which means uh, that man uh, got to receive 10 kisses from the old man. Ah, uh. oh, yeah, in the end, uh, he was uh, caught uh, terrible for the bad intention, uh, uh, the, uh, the improper thinking of this. Uh. Uh, this is a joke, but it's quite interesting in a sense that one who is lustful and craves for unwholesome things uh, will meet with undesirable or painful situations. Now, lust and greed and unwholesome desire is a mental deformment. Uh, we can say in uh, Pali is uh, no, uh, Loba and Ragala. 
Loba and Raga. Loba is more of greed. Raga is more of lust. Uh. So it's craving uh, for all those unwholesome things uh, that will bring suffering to yourself and suffering to other people. So you think you can escape with all those mental, uh, all those needs based on mental defilements, uh, you will be sorry. Matter of time, you will meet with undesirable or painful situations, sometimes embarrassing situations also, as you can see here from the picture. So you are scarred. Uh, you will lose the money. You got to pay for the money. La. He, he didn't want to get the tissues from the old man. So you have to pay for the clock. La. He's a promoter. Ma. Ah, so you see la, who suffers. La. Okay, so let us go on to the next one. Next one is quite interesting. It's the materialistic lawyer. Now, you know, materialistic means uh, just emphasizing on material things. La, uh, money, la, uh, shares, la, house, la, and then uh, land, la, and then also cars, la, and then some also maybe even have their private jets. La. All these things uh, you find are material possessions and wealth, worldly ones, and some people will crave for this. Their life all centers on this only. So let's look at the joke. A very successful lawyer drove his brand new million dollar Ferrari, you know, wow, Ferrari, uh, one of the most expensive cars, a real Porsche car. Drove it to his legal firm, la, his office. He wants to show off. La. The, the egoistic lawyer wanted to uh, show his car to his colleagues la, to uh, brag. La. He said, you want to have you seen the Ferrari? I come outside and see something like that. La. So he was parking the car uh, just outside, you know, maybe uh, a parking space, uh, you know, uh, I'm supposed to be a very well-known lawyer, so outside the office. But as he got out of the car, so he opened the door of the car and then stepped, as and then stepped aside near it, uh, right? Then he, I mean, he got out and get it. Uh. There was a truck, you know, uh, I showed the Ferrari uh, image, uh, and then also a truck. Uh. So a truck came close to the curb, no, came very near to the, the place where he parked the car. And then since the door was open, uh, uh, the driver's seat door there, uh, right? So he, he ripped off the driver's door. No. Uh, that means the door, the front, I mean the door corresponding to the driver's seat. Uh. So uh, wow, the, because he opened the door, uh, so he came very near. So the truck just drove into the door and uh, got the door out already. <laughs> Drag the door with it already. Wow. The lawyer was very, very furious. Uh, he got his uh, mobile phone or whatever. And he immediately called for the police. No, with the mobile phone. And in less than five minutes, a policeman came and pulled over. That means he came, parked his car nearby and then wanted to see the matter. So before he could say anything, the lawyer started screaming already, complaining about his damaged new Ferrari. Uh, he just saw the, the, the dog, quite a brand new one. Uh, the dog gone already. He said, my new car is gone. No amount of repair can make it new again. The daughter, yeah, uh, the lawyer yelled, you know, oh, this loss is really breaking my heart. Uh, he said, repair also useless. You cannot uh, retain the originally original look already. Oh, uh, it's breaking my heart. The policeman, was observing uh, with disgust uh, and disbelief. He shook his head and then told the lawyer, I can't understand how materialistic you lawyers can get. Here you are so focused on your new car. Didn't you realize that your left arm is missing already? Also ripped off by the truck? Wow, you know, he was so concerned about the car. He was not even uh, paying attention, or maybe he also the attention was not on the arm, you know, the arm had already gone off already. Huh? You see, the mind uh, could uh, be like that uh, to the extent that maybe he could not even feel the pain already because he was so concerned over the car. And then the lawyer, uh, after hearing that, uh, he started to cry. Uh, oh, what about my Rolex watch? What about my Rolex watch? Because I was wearing the Rolex watch on the arm that was ripped off. It's just a joke, but it's just a fantastic lesson. Now, some are so obsessed by materialistic wealth 
that they forget or ignore the many more important things in life. And this is happening very often. Look at the scandals. YMDB scandal. Millions of billions of dollars cheated out from a fund, taxpayers' money and so on, because of people who are so obsessed with money. And they didn't even bother about the terrible things that could happen to other people. And not only that, they also uh, have no wisdom uh, to consider the point that they will be caught one day, even in this world, uh, not talking about karma, uh, in this world, uh, uh, it's actually there's karma also, uh, present karma, uh, right? that he will be caught as today you see the court cases involving uh, uh, so-called VIPs, uh, uh, charged for corruption, money laundering, CBT, uh, criminal breach of trust, all those terrible things, you know. Why? Greed. Terrible greed. And then resorting to evil ways uh, of cheating, lying, and so on, uh, swindling. So uh, a lot of cases, uh, you know, about the scams, uh, the con man, and so on. So many cases, they focus on this material things. Uh, but don't realize uh, that there's a price to pay. There will be cases uh, later on, you find uh, even uh, big shots and wealthy people become bankrupt and people uh, spit at them also. They look down uh, so lowly. Uh. So what's the use? What's the deal? Compared to a simple, honest hawker who lives a life with great contentment and then he later on dies also quite peacefully. So you see, uh, you may think uh, it's very common sense, uh, but common sense is not that common. And once the departments conquer you, uh, the departments of what we call greed, covetousness, craving, attachment, and then the ego, uh, and then the delusion, uh, not knowing the true nature of things. Uh. All these are impermanent. You can't bring with you when you die. You can't even bring your body, let alone any material things. So when a person has wisdom, uh, he knows how to reflect uh, then he is going on the path towards actual peace and happiness, not in this life alone, but also in future lives. So this is just a joke about the materialistic lawyer. So very concerned and attached to worldly things like a car or a watch, a Rolex watch, very expensive. You might think it's a joke, but actually in my life, I encounter one case with a friend. So it was this friend of mine who was teaching with me in Kota Baru. No? He was so concerned about the car. You know? uh, so he, uh, those days, uh, I was in my 20s, uh, so you go for movies. Uh, so he said, he said, Mr. Oh, uh, you know, I cannot use my quite new car, you know, because if I use my car and park it, park it outside the theater, uh, what happens if somebody scratches it, if somebody does something to it, so can you give me a lift on your motorbike? Uh? Uh, what to do? I say, okay. La. Oh, you all imagine uh, quite a heavy person. Uh. So my poor motorbike, I fetch him there. So we were friends. Well, we played ping pong together. Then one of the days, uh, I time a leave uh, uh, for the school vacation from Kota Baru uh, to go to Kuala Lumpur. Quite a distance, you know, maybe along the East-West Highway. La. It was a very difficult journey. Uh, the time roads were not so good. And then also, you know, it would take uh, many, many hours. So I suggested to him, I said, why not we break journey? We put one night maybe in Kuantan or somewhere around there, halfway through or whatnot, uh, and then they continue the journey. He said, oh, I must be able to find a hotel or a rest house uh, where my room, uh, through the window, I can see my park car. Uh, uh, what happens if suddenly people uh, take away the car, then uh, no longer there, I had it. Uh, you know what to do? So uh, I had to, uh, I'm dumping a leaf. Uh. So I followed him. And then, uh, so we reached halfway point already. Uh, after many hours, it started, I think, in the afternoon, uh, after the school assembly or something like that. Uh. Then, you know, he couldn't find a place, you know, like that. He said, no, 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 we have to drive through to KL. Uh, I said, it's very dangerous, no car highway, you could fall down the cliff. He said, no, 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 I have to, you know, the car. So what to do? So uh, sitting beside him, I had to continually, continuously feed him with the hard sweets, uh, because I uh, you fall asleep and I couldn't drive on the highway at that stage, that time. 
right? So you fall down on the down the cliff they had it. Uh, so I had to chit chat with him and so on. Uh, wow, I reached KL, I think at uh, 2 a.m. or something like that, you know, two or three. Uh, so imagine a person so attached to the car to the extent that uh, they cannot see the other important thing. So many other incidents, I just give you this one that I remember. So many years later, so we parted ways, so it was transferred back to uh, near Penang area, and I went back to Para. And one day I visited him in his home, you know, right? I think it was in Bukit Metajam or one of the areas there. Then I visited him. Then I asked him, how's your car now? <laughs> right? Then he shook his head. He was, you know, uh, very old and uh, not healthy looking. I don't bother about the car already. Lah. Ah, then I found uh, that he nearly died of a massive heart attack. So that incident changed his whole outlook. Really. The life uh, is much more than being attached to material things. Uh, so he changed his ways. Uh, that is a very interesting point for you to reflect. Uh. So we must make sure that we are not obsessed or crave and have great greed for materials, materials, wealth and possessions until we forget or ignore the many more important things in life, especially Dharma cultivation. Your true wealth, as I've said many times, just your karma, your good karma and the good Dharma that you learn. Those are the things only that matter eventually. Uh, that is for you to reflect. Ah, so now we come to the end of the presentation title of Humor, Laughter and Wisdom. And uh, we have written this um, couplet, uh, uh, which actually has rhyme as well as rhythm. Uh. Right, uh, you find that the two words rhyme and then also number of syllables. So this, I like to write such uh, couplets. Uh, uh, they're quite poetic, nice to read. But when you translate to Chinese, you cannot have that rhyming and things like that, really. So I wrote, may you love your way to good health. May wisdom be your greatest wealth. Now let's look at this. Uh, as I've said just now, that laughter is good for health. That's why we started off by saying, a laugh a day keeps the doctor away. And there has been many, many research, a lot of research work uh, uh, that really show the truth of this. I've done quite a lot of postings uh, on humor, laughter, and the benefits uh, of laughter. I've written this also in some of my, I think, uh, pre-Dharma books also, I did mention, and also some of the uh, humor and wisdom books I wrote. Uh, so, so, some people uh, don't have the sense of humor and cannot see life's lighter way. No? To see uh, the lighter things of life, everything so serious and get stressed up. I remember I had a friend in Sri Para, uh, right? Who was very, very serious. No? Sometimes with my friends, I would joke on this, and then he would come into the staff room and say, Why are y'all why are y'all laughing? Then we say, oh, you know, that was this joke we think. Uh, so all of us were having a good laugh and he will see what's so funny, what's so funny. So some people just have no sense of humor and uh, they can hardly laugh. So remember that laughter is good for health. But it must be a genuine one and clean jokes. Lah. I don't deal with dirty jokes, right? And then I uh, may wisdom be your greatest wealth. Yeah. In fact, wisdom is a fantastic thing. It's one of the two things uh, in the whole of Dharma practice, wisdom and compassion. So it is indeed uh, uh, well, not the greatest, or if not, one of the greatest wealth. Obviously, the greatest wealth is to be enlightened. Uh, right? But to have enlightenment, there must be wisdom. Uh, all right? Isn't it? So, and you can't get just the wisdom just by, you know, uh, going to universities and then get your degrees and so on. The wisdom is a whole lifelong process. And the wisdom uh, has to be cultivated. And it is best cultivated the Dhamma way. Uh, that you practice the Dhamma in the following ways. That you have to do the dana. That means to cut the ego self, then only you can see things more clearly. Otherwise, you all will anchor on me, my, and mine. And then you have to observe your morality so that your mind will be at ease, free from regret, remorse, guilt, and all those things. Then only you can see things clearly. Right? So then, of course, the third one is the bawana, which means you must have the development of the mind through learning, understanding, reflecting, 
discussing the Dharma with the good spiritual friends and practicing. Then one day, you too will have the wisdom bloom to such a high level. And at the peak, you are enlightened. You are enlightened. So, uh, so you see, we have actually discussed uh, many jokes, pieces of humor. But the important thing that you must not forget is the Dharma. I have tried to link la, because it's a, another way of presenting the Dharma, isn't it? If I were to always just read from the suttas and then there's some comments and so on, then many people tell me, well, it's very difficult, it's quite dry and so on. So uh, for, uh, unless you are serious meditators or maybe you are very cultivated, la. but most people uh, will need the, the Dharma presented uh, in an easier to understand way. La. That's why Ajahn Brahm is so popular because you listen to his Dharma talks, uh, full of stories, uh, uh, full of humor, full of wit. Uh. I learned a lot from him. Uh, even at the retreat also, uh, uh, we learned very, very interesting things, especially his stories and his touch of humor and wit. So then from there, you can go on. Uh, the Dharma strikes you already. Then you go on into more serious things already. Sutta study, uh, reflection and meditation. Uh, so this is what I can share with you uh, regard to the Dharma. La. And the gift of Dharma is the greatest gift. So before we say sadhu three times, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank all brothers and sisters in the Dharma, uh, young and old, and also the not so young, not so old, <laughs> the middle age, uh, and particularly the youth members. Uh, uh, it's important that we direct Dharma to the younger ones also, apart from the older ones. And children uh, who are very mature, uh, some of them are very good. Uh, even primary school, uh, I've seen uh, some uh, that can understand and learn the Dharma faster than even some adults. So to all these people, right, I would like to say thank you and sadhu to all of you for spending time and putting in the effort and energy and also giving attention to the presentation. Right? So let us now uh, put our palms together and say sadhu three times. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May you all be well, happy and peaceful. And may the Dhamma be with all of you always. Take care.